I remember hearing a former Bishop of Bradford, Bishop David Smith, on more than one occasion remarking that he found clergy frequently preaching about love, but far less often about hope. He called on us to redress the balance because hope is transformative. Advent and Christmas 2020 is certainly a time when we should be responding to that call. And so I am delighted that Father Simon Cuff agreed to deliver this Bingley lecture on the subject. The lecture itself is something of a parable of hope. With all that has been going on this year, I had not dared hope that it would be possible. But through the good offices of Father Mike Green, and with well over a week of the year remaining, we are happy to broadcast the only Bingley lecture of 2020. It's a real pleasure to be with you even virtually for this abridged Bingley lecture on the theme of Christmas hope. I'm especially glad to be invited to talk to the theme of Christmas hope, because hope has been a theme with which I've long wrestled and by which I've long been fascinated and to think about hope during the season of waiting, longing and hoping, that is Advent, has been especially poignant. There's something about the theme of Christmas hope which seems especially grounded and especially enfleshed. The prologue to St John's Gospel climaxes with those famous words, and the word was made flesh. And almost everything I want to say can be summed up similarly. And if you want to stop listening now, all that I want to say really is hope for a Christian is this. Jesus Christ is hope made flesh. Recently, a colleague at St Melitus, Jared Lovell, a brilliant theologian, delivered a homily on hope and the task of theology. He reminded us as a college that part of the task of theology is to consider how concepts that have an everyday meaning, concepts like hope, have a particular meaning when we use them theologically. One of the tasks of theology is to make us aware of when we're carrying over something from an everyday use of a concept that might mislead us in our thinking about God and in our following Christ. When it comes to hope in a Christian sense, we also have the problem of hope being such a widespread and frequently used term in Christian life that we don't take much time to think about what we really mean when we say hope. Hope appears again and again in scripture, particularly in the New Testament. The first letter of Peter, chapter 3, verse 15, calls on us to give an account for the hope that is in us. Ephesians 4, 4, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians Chapter 13, verse 13, famously tells us, faith, hope and love abide. Hope is also present in our worship and in our liturgies. Think of the traditional funeral service from the Book of Common Prayer. Earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, ensure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life. Hope is present in our hymns and worship songs. All my hope on God is founded. Hope is found in our Christmas carols. O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. Yet in the dark street shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. Hope is an everyday part of our Christian discourse and is everywhere. We might even say that for Christians, there is a pandemic of hope. Hope is so widespread in our Christian speaking and thinking. And so it makes it harder for us to pause and reflect on the peculiar nature of Christian hope. We think rightly that to be Christian is to be part of a people of hope. But the particular nature of that hope can quickly pass us by. I wanted to spend a little time together reflecting on the nature of hope generally and on Christian hope in particular. 
and on the strangeness of Christian hope. Think about how we use hope in an everyday sense. I hope we're having chips for tea. I hope City win the match. I hope he's not there. Hope is forward-looking and provisional. If we've just finished our trips, or we know that City just won the match, or he, whoever he is, probably Father Mike, is there, it's nonsensical to say that we hope for these things. Hope that is seen is not hope, as St Paul puts it in the letter to the Romans, the 8th chapter, the 24th verse. If we know something to be true, we cannot hope it to be the case. There's an uncertainty to hope that makes it hope. Here's where Christian hope gets a bit strange. For in hope we were saved, Paul writes in the letter to the Romans. There is a guarantee and certainty to Christian hope that would render everyday hope no longer hope. Yet the guarantee and certainty of Christian hope doesn't leave us hopeless. It is in fact the very ground of our Christian hope. What does this mean for Christmas hope? It's not unusual for the birth of a child to be the fulfilment of hope. Lots of couples hope for the birth of a child. Unfortunately, there are many couples whose hope for a child is never fulfilled. However, for those fortunate enough to rejoice at the birth of a child, the birth of a child is not the end of a parent's hope for that child. Parents hope that the child may be healthy, do well at school, enjoy a profitable career, and so on and so on and so on. And yet the birth of the Christ child is different. In this birth, our hope is fulfilled. The hopes and dreams of all the years are met in him that night. And yet even though in Christ our hope is fulfilled, our hope also persists. We remain a people of hope. What's going on here? What is this strange kind of hope that is both fulfilled in Christ and yet doggedly persists? What is this hope that is both hope and certainty? Part of this, I think, lies in something else in the nature of Christian hope. The depth of the hope that is fulfilled in Christ. It's not just that all our earthly hopes find fulfilment in Christ, In a sense, they are transcended. Christ's coming upends our expectation for what God's Messiah might look like. Christ fulfills hopes and longings we did not know we had. Our hope isn't fulfilled with some mighty set of divine gifts or in the hand of a mighty warrior who comes to deliver us. Our hope is fulfilled in the first gasping breaths of a newborn child. This, or rather he, is the source of our Christian hope, the child in which all our hopes are fulfilled, or perhaps we might better say transcended. We might be totally fulfilled, we might have everything we've wanted or for which we've hoped, and yet something else remains. The former Pope, Pope Benedict XVI, described this persistent longing that remains even when earthly hopes are fulfilled. He wrote in his own reflection on hope, that when these hopes are fulfilled, however, it becomes clear that they were not in reality the whole. It becomes evident that we have need of a hope that goes further. It becomes clear that only something infinite will suffice for us, something that always be more than we can ever attain. It's this something more which I think is the key to Christian hope the particular way in which the birth of the Christ child transcends even the deepest of our earthly longings. One reason this hope remains, even though it is the means of our salvation, even though it is a hope grounded in God's guarantee, is that this child is a reminder that our true hope, our true home, lies elsewhere, in the infinite to which Pope Benedict refers. It is because of who this child is that hope is both sure 
and yet remains hope. It is because this child is God himself, the word made flesh, that our hope in Christ is both the means of our salvation and the source of its transcendence. Our hope is fulfilled in Christ, but because Christ is God's offer of himself to us in time, we know that our hope will not be fully realised until that day we see God face to face. It is because we celebrate the birth of God as one of us, and because we believe that, as St Paul says, we know that we see through a glass darkly, but will one day see face to face that we are a people of hope. Hope, because we know that the fullness of our salvation exhausts our earthly knowledge and transcends even the most glorious of our earthly understandings. Hope, because we recognise the limitations of our human ability to comprehend the reality of the God who meets us in the Christ child. Hope, because hope is the essential ingredient of human life. Human life can tolerate suffering and adversity and some of the very worst situations, as long as there is hope. Because the hope that whatever situation is being experienced provides confidence that that situation may end, that it is never the final word. The very worst thing we can do to another human being is to deprive them of hope. Hope rejects full certainty. It recognises that truth is fragile and precious, as fragile and precious as a newborn, because truth was itself, for a time, a newborn, the newborn whose birth we are preparing to celebrate. To be a person of hope, to be a people of hope, transforms how we inhabit our faith. Hope rejects easy answers. Christian hope opens itself to the kind of questioning and challenging that we find is a hallmark of the ministry of Jesus. Rowan Williams, in an article in the Radio Times, once pointed to this as a central theme of Christmas. He writes, Christmas tells us two big things. First, what changes things isn't a formula for getting the right answer, but a willingness to stop and let yourself be challenged right to the roots of your being. And second, we can find the courage to let this happen because we are let into the secret that we are in the hands of love, committed, unshakable love. Hope opens to us the space to question and be questioned, to challenge and be challenged, not to do so hopelessly or defencelessly or without foundation, but because we are grounded in the committed and unshakable love that revealed itself to us in that first Christmas. We find a flavour of this Christmas hope in the poem Christmas by John Betjeman, with which I'm going to end this reflection. The hope which is grounded on Christ, open to being challenged to the very depths of our being, and full of the kind of faithful questioning that is the hallmark of genuine hope, is shot through in this poem. And is it true, and is it true, this most tremendous tale of all, seen in a stained glass window's hue, a baby in an ox's stall, the maker of the stars and sea, become a child on earth for me. Christian hope is the hope to have the confidence to ask those questions. And is it true? Is it true? Christmas hope is our celebration of the start of all Christian hope. The revelation of God to us in Christ that grounds our faith, satisfies and transcends even our deepest longings and transforms the very way we live our lives. Hope 
makes us realise the limitations of earthly fulfilment and false certainty. We are taken beyond our earthly lives as we look forward to the heavenly reality we shall one day see face to face. Hope takes us beyond ourselves, not only toward God, but toward each other. Pope Benedict again puts this best. Our hope, he writes, is always essentially also hope for others. Only thus is it truly hope for me too. As Christians, we should never limit ourselves to asking, how can I save myself? We should also ask, what can I do in order that others may be saved, and that for them too the star of hope may rise? Then I will have done my utmost for my own personal salvation as well. To be a person of hope is to be committed to be a people of hope and to be offering hope to others, not just earthly hope, but the hope that transcends all earthly hopes, whose birth we celebrate at Christmas. And as Christians, our vocation to bring hope has never perhaps more been needed than in this strange and difficult year. Sometimes, the birth of a child over 2,000 years ago can seem a very distant source of hope. But again, it's because of who that child is that the source of hope is always nearer to us than we can ever possibly conceive. Not only is that hope grounded in the gift of God to us in the Christ child, but in fact God is constantly giving himself to us in the gift of himself to us in Christ, in the gift of himself to us in the Spirit, alive in his Church, in the gift of himself in the sacraments, the Eucharist, baptism, that we celebrate week in, week out. This is where Betjeman's poem Christmas ends, and this is a good place for us to end this reflection on hope, to end at the place where all Christian hope begins, God's very gift of himself to us in Christ. That gift which causes us to give gifts and share hope with others. Those gifts and that hope of which this year and every year we all sorely need. The gifts which point us toward the true gift of hope. God's gift of himself to us in Christ at Christmas. Christmas by John Betjeman. The bells of waiting advent ring. The tortoise stove is lit again. And lamp oil light across the night has caught the streaks of winter rain in many a stained glass window sheen from crimson lake to hooker's green. The holly in the windy hedge and round the manor house the yew will soon be stripped to deck the ledge the altar, font and arch and pew, so that the villagers can say, the church looks nice on Christmas day. Provincial public houses blaze, corporation tramcars clang, on lighted tenements I gaze, where paper decorations hang, and bunting in the red town hall says, Merry Christmas to you all. And London shops on Christmas Eve are strung with silver bells and flowers, as hurrying clerks the city leave, to pigeon-haunted classic towers, and marbled clouds go scudding by the many steepled London sky. And girls in slacks remember Dad, and oafish louts remember Mum, and sleepless children's hearts are glad, and Christmas morning bells say come, even to shining ones who dwell, safe in the Dorchester Hotel. And is it true? And is it true? The most tremendous tale of all. Seen in a stained glass window's hue. A baby in an ox's stall. The maker of the stars and sea. Become a child on earth for me. And is it true? For if it is, no loving fingers tying strings around those tissued fripperies. 
the sweet and silly Christmas things. Bath salts and inexpensive scent, and hideous tie, so kindly meant. No love that in a family dwells, no caroling in frosty air, nor all the steeple shaking bells can with this single truth compare. That God was man in Palestine and lives today in bread and wine.